How are you all? Great. I noticed none of you brought food, which concerns me only slightly that no one has eaten. <laughs> like, I'm a fat kid, so I feel like that is like priority one. And if my audience hasn't eaten, I'm concerned. Uh, so I'd like to start off today, and like I said, I think we've got several experts in the, in the room uh, to go around and if you can give a brief introduction of yourself, your name, what company you're with, uh, and then what brought you here today, or kind of what are you hoping to get out of this presentation today? So we'll go ahead and get started over here with Trevor. Hi everybody, Trevor Gottfried, Gottfried Media Group. I run a small digital marketing firm focusing on social media for small businesses. I guess today I'm looking for the best way to find partners for my business. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for somebody a little more experienced in growing a business to help me. So that's what I'm looking for. Very cool. Thank you very much. Sally. Yes, hello. I'm Sally Putnam. I'm a certified financial planner and my company is now financial and I guess I'm just looking for ways to help my clients. Wonderful. Thank you very much. What kind of clients do you work with, Sally? I work with, um, primarily, I work with uh, women, women-owned businesses and um, people divorcing. Okay, very cool. Thank you very much. And we'll go back here. You always let me go first. Yeah, as I say. <laughs> I'm out of it. Uh, so, uh, my name is Tolga Kura. I am with AZ Finance Group. Uh, most small businesses we found have uh, bookkeepers and uh, accountants do their CPAs. I mean, the CPAs do their uh, taxes. But they really don't have like a CFO or finance type of function to help them make data-driven decisions. Uh, we are a group of six people, uh, who, uh, plus some other partners outside. We've been doing it for about a year, helping businesses uh, raise capital to make capital investments um, and doing financial statements when they're out there trying to raise money. Um, and we brought Linnell on just recently. Uh, he's our sales guy. The rest of us are a bunch of nerds. So, <laughs> you speak human. <laughs> That's good. That's who you need on your team. I'm the guy with the pocket protector, so. There you go. That's, that's kind of where we are. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, gentlemen, very much for joining us. Uh, what was kind of your goal in coming here today? I mean, you work in the finance funding field, so you know, part of the discussion. As, uh, helping friends and family. And yeah. And soon we realized there was demand out there, and then we decided, hey, maybe we want to do this a little bit more formal, you know, we're in the process of getting an office, and then. He suggested we join the uh, Chamber of Commerce. This is my second event here, so I'm kind of learning as I go. I, I, I used to be in corporate America before this, so this is kind of all new for me. And very cool. Well, welcome to entrepreneurship, and the Chamber is a very good place for both of you to be at. So thank you very much for joining us today. George. I am George Kimball with J.P. Morgan Chase. I'm a business relationship manager, and I manage about 100 to 200 different <coughs> small businesses in my portfolio. And uh, from large to small, typically between a million to 10 million in gross revenue is, is my niche uh, of clients that I work with. And my focus is trying to find ways for my clients, especially the startups that I work with, uh, very, very difficult <coughs> from the traditional bank financing, where we're cash flow lenders with two years of financial. You don't have it, so what do we do? And trying to find alternative solutions to help those small business startup clients. Wonderful. Thank you very much, George. Hi, I'm Michelle Gray. I'm with Amerisource HR. So I do HR consulting, customized consulting, so not necessarily a PEO. We get asked that all the time. Mm -hmm. And so really today, you know, I'm here trying to understand and, and really focus on the strategy of spinning off the division of my own mm -hmm. and realistically positioning it right to, to help the clients, which are small businesses that mm -hmm. don't have an HR, at the same time, not just taking anything and everything and going, ah, what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. So trying to be smart about how the business, the financing of it, growing it, and kind of being different than everybody else because there are lots of consultants out there. So how do you okay. make that different in your business? Very cool. Challenging topic to cover in all one thing, but we'll see if we can get yes. there for you. <laughs> Sarah, that sound good? All right. Back table. Okay. Hmm. Uh, my name's Keith Gernant. I own my own law firm. Uh, I focus on helping small businesses get started, help them run, help them grow. Uh, I'm here today because I want to learn more about ways that I can help advise my clients in getting funding for their businesses to help them grow. Wonderful. Get started. It's so much easier to help people who want to help other people. Much less questions. I can definitely help on that. I like a nice low bar to start with. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Sam Seto. I'm Dragon Sam. I own Dragon Walk. I own a Dragon Walk. I've been in business 
for 27 years. It's my fifth restaurant, but I'm just getting more involved with a lot of different events, a lot of different things. So I'm just like interested in learning some uh, financial things. Because... See, that's a low bar, people. I just want to learn about general financing things. Gotcha. Learn more stuff. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us. Part of Gibson Landings Credit Union um, business development on on individuals and uh, small business. A little bit like George, you always look for alternative ways of financing and learn a little something new. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And Jeff. I'm Kristen's, uh, Kristen's driver. Yeah. <laughs> he escorted me here. He's in charge of making sure I don't get out of line. He's my boss, so be nice. <laughs> so yeah, I'm with the SPDC. I've been with the SPDC for six years. I'm part of the leadership team. So, And I also coordinate our lender relationships. So there's a few that I don't know. And that's bad. So we need to know each other. Because um, we, as you'll learn, we help clients um, find that, that funding, the source that they need. Very cool. Well, to give you guys a little bit of setup today, uh, as you can see, there's lots of people in the room that know lots of things, so I would like to keep today fairly informal. Uh, we're going to start off today by going over just general categories, kind of educational pieces, best practices, but I really want to keep the conversation going, stay engaged. If you have questions as we go along, if you have input or feedback as we go along, feel free to chime in, and I'm sure we're going to have people joining it. So let me start off with telling you a little bit about myself. My name is Kristen Slice. I'm a business analyst with the Maricopa Small Business Development Center. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the SBDC? Somewhat. There you go. Three or four. See? Now we're already, we've already paid why we need to be here because we're educating people along. So we're part of a nationwide network of small business development centers. We are housed locally within Maricopa Community Colleges, funded by the Small Business Administration. So your tax dollars at work. Our mission is singular. It is to help small businesses create economic impact. Our definition of economic impact is increasing jobs, accessing capital, and growing your sales. So how we work with small businesses is business analysts like myself, who are all uh, Entrepreneurs in our own right and experts in various industries will work as a team. We have 12 different business analysts across Phoenix. Uh, we work as a team to serve whatever the need of that entrepreneur is. So we provide a, another sounding board for some businesses. In other businesses, we help them put together loan packages. You name it, we are a multi-tool uh, in the bucket of small business tools. I catch everything, that one? Good enough. There you go. Good enough, right? Good enough for government work. <laughs> Get it? So today we're talking about small business financing. Money makes the, wor the world go round, right? But it's not an easy challenge to talk about uh, because there are lots of things. And it always seems to me whenever I talk about funding, uh, money it seems like should be like a black and white situation, right? It's numbers. Uh, the more I get into it, the more I learn about the gray of different data points and what some people call Series A and other people call C funding and some people call loans and things like that. So there's lots of things. Today my goal is to kind of give you a general overview so that you're familiar with all of the terms and then we'll dive deeper into some of the specific questions that we might have as we go along. PowerPoint. So. Let's talk about sources of funding. So this diagram specifically talks about startup, and here's where we already have some of our gray area. So where, when you hear startup funding for small businesses, where is the impression that that money comes from? So I have an idea. I need money to get started. Where, before you look at this screen, would you have said, hey, this is where small businesses get startup funds from? What are some of the sources? Family. Family. Personal savings. Personal savings. Equity lines. Equity lines. Anything else? Savings. Savings. Good. Any other ones? Well, you guys hit the two. Say it again. Credit cards. Credit cards. So you guys hit the good ones, which I appreciate. Uh, already we're kind of on track. So this kind of chops this pie into lots of different pieces and use two different words. This is basically what you need to know. 50% of startup funding comes from either personal funding, savings account, 401k, or bootstrapping. 38% comes from friends and family, right? So overwhelming the majority of funding when you talk startup funds specifically comes from internal sources, right? And you can see all those other pieces, but it's funny because when you attend other presentations or people talk about funding, they get real excited. No one talked about Shark Tank yet. Shark Tank is like the bane of my existence as a business counselor because everyone just comes in and is like, I'm going to be on Shark Tank. I'm like, good luck with that. Let me know how that goes, right? And I'm going to work on my pitch because I'm going to get you know, an investor. So today we're going to talk about the reality of where those sources of funding are, 
what they exist and pieces like that. We did have someone join us late, not to call you out, but give me a brief introduction of yourself, who your name, and who you're with, so I know. Mark Stewart, uh, council member elect and owner of Concepts and Solutions. We help investors get products to market. So. Okay. And so what was kind of the question or what brought you here today? I mean, you work with inventors, so that's kind of obvious, but what was the goal of what you were hoping to get out of today? So I know a lot of things about finding financing. Mm -hmm. uh, usually it's like we were talking about uh, mm -hmm. with your family, it's usually the first start. But then eventually if you've uh, established a brand or a product, then you can usually find a little bit of uh, angel investing. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of put it all in a box. Good. And we'll have a little bit better understanding. And you said it was Michael? And also network. Mark. Mark. So Mark gave me an excellent transition, right? So absolutely, most of it comes from personal. And then once you get established, if we had to talk about second large myths that we address, once you get established, you've proven some market validation, you've got some elements of your business plan and things put together, then there are other, some other financial options that open up to you. There we go. So bootstrapping is exactly what we talked about, which is the, what the majority of startup businesses do. How can you pull together credit cards? How can you put into your 401k? How do you start to make it work, right? And a lot of these things look like gluing things together for people. The next topic that we have, it's funny, this is kind of hard to see, right? Am I the only one? Am I having like vision problems, right? So the second piece, and I wanted to put this in here, which is growing in popularity, is crowdfunding. Someone give me a definition of crowdfunding. Kickstarter, Kickstarter. good. What were the other ones? GoFundMe. GoFundMe. So those are some of the platforms. What's a definition of crowdfunding as a concept? Getting money from people you don't know to simply believe in you or what you're doing. Good. Uh, the only piece I would change to that is over 80% of crowdfunding comes from people you actually know. Really? Yes, which is a common misnomer about crowdfunding. So the JOBS Act made it legal for people to be able to make small investments in small business, if but not in an equity sense. So normally it was a prize return. So how many of you have ever donated to a crowdfunding campaign? Anyone? What were some of the things you got from it? Upgrades to the product. Upgrades to the product, good. And what kind of product was it? Games. Games are, I think, the second highest category on crowdfunding platforms are games and movie development. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Who, what did you invest in and what did you get back? Uh, music album. Music album. And did you get a copy of the album for free? <laughs> there you go. All right. Anything else? So when it comes to small business, those are traditionally, and it was funny because someone I heard the analogy once. They're like, oh, crowdfunding is this new technology that we're just getting into. No, it's not. Anybody ever been to church? Crowdfunding 101, right? When they hand around that plate. So same concept. It's getting, it's getting funding from the people that you know in a facilitated platform. So there are lots of platforms that are out there. Certain products and certain industries work really well on crowdfunding. You gave perfect examples of the most common ones that are out there. Increasingly, we are seeing a proliferation of platforms that are specific to small businesses, meaning they have a product that they are looking to sell. And what crowdfunding does really well is it is a market validation tool. Are people willing to buy this before I have to invest a lot of money in manufacturing it? So those are some of the examples of what we're seeing on crowdfunding. There is now coming out rules around equity crowdfunding meaning that I give you money and you give me a piece of ownership and it's facilitated through a website. Uh, the lawyer in the room might be having an aneurysm at the fact that I even brought this up, right? Because you okay? You're not gonna pass out? Okay, good, good. Because some of the lawyers I talked to are like, why would you even talk about it? We don't know yet, stop it. It is still a relatively new territory. One of the things to keep in mind about crowdfunding is the statistic that I said earlier. Uh, most of the people that will be funding you through crowdfunding come from your own personal network, meaning that you need to have an established social media presence, a strategy going into it, uh, a series of ways of how do you present the video, how do you roll out new processes in order for crowdfunding to be really successful. One of the things that excites me about crowdfunding is the people who tend to do really well on crowdfunding are doing better. It's one of the only streams of um, funding that women and minorities actually do better on crowdfunding. So the average success rate for a man is 30% on crowdfunding, whereas women run closer to 40. So 
So in other words, 70% of things that are on crowdfunding are going to fail? Yep. If you're Not fail, but will fail to get funded. Fail to get funded. So how crowdfunding so and... You got it, right? And so most of the time, and most of them are fairly established businesses that run crowdfunding campaigns as well. So they'll have, they'll have something already in the works and they use crowdfunding because you have to have that established network. So there are very few organizations that haven't done a first run of some sort of item and are now looking to, all right, I need to order a large quantity of this, so let's crowdfund it to get that funding for it. So you almost say that crowdfunding is almost as much marketing as it is fundraising because they're trying to kind of do both in one fell swoop? I would argue it is 90% marketing and 10% fundraising. And so it is more, and I appreciate at least one person nodding their head on that. So it is more about putting together the marketing strategy and that marketing validation piece to it than it really is the fundraising. But the benefit is it's, it's a fair amount of work, but you've already, it is marketing, so it will continue to go on. So a successful crowdfunding campaign means you've already got market validation. You're already out there. You're already building the networks versus if we spend a lot of time going after investors and then we don't get investors, that's just the nature of that beast, right? So there's not as much long-term validation and marketing efforts that go into it. So it's kind of a nice leverage point. And the average, so the average crowdfunding campaign runs around 30, 40 grand. So we're not talking a lot that comes from crowdfunding when it comes to those sources. Anything else you wanted to add about crowdfunding? So you're nodding your head. Oh, I was just agreeing with the marketing aspect of it. I like that. Thank you. Process. Yeah, so it is. It's a lot of marketing. It's a lot of validation. George. Yeah. You got it. So a lot of it, uh, there are specific consultants that work actually in crowdfunding because it is a challenging area in terms of the marketing strategy aspect of it. Uh, the requirements on different platforms kind of vary. So there are, you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, GoFundMe are the big platforms that people know about. Uh, all of those have different rules that are important to get comfortable with, right? Some of them require you to be an LLC. Some of them require you to have specific things set up. Most of them, the general rule is you tell us how many days you're going to raise X amount of money. And if you don't raise X amount of money in X number of days, we're going to give all the money back to people and you get none of it. So that's the big piece behind Kickstarter. Indiegogo's got some different rules around it, like if you raise X number, then it might go back and things like that. Mm -hmm. I would just add with the equity crowdfunding, there's a lot, lot more rules to it. There is. You, there. you have to have basically the same things as a normal stock issuance. You have to have, like, uh, I'm trying to think of what they call it, I can't remember. Basically, uh, prospectus. Yes, prospectus. You have to have stuff like that in order to equity crowdfunding. And so there are a couple of platforms that are coming out that are specifically trying to address all of those challenges. But like I said, a lot of that is still emerging, still kind of trying to figure out the legalities behind it is that are going into I, it. I understand. Is there a limit to the number of people that you can have in a crowdfunding? I thought it was something to do with different number of I think equity is 450. Yeah, so. equity is different than, what, than regular crowdfunding. And so from regular crowdfunding, there is not a limit to the number of people. Like the, the most successful crowdfunding campaign to date is Pebble Watch, literally a watch that like just blew away every expectation when it got up, got up there. The second, like the fastest uh, successful crowdfunding campaign was the Veronica Mars movie. It was completely crowdfunded. So things, and that was millions of people that crowdfunded like a dollar or two to get that product, project up and running. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about the next category, which gets to uh, your point of some of the elements that get a little bit more complicated. So those are kind of the first starting points. Now we're starting to talk about equity funding, meaning someone else is giving you funding and in exchange, they are getting ownership within your business or there's some sort of agreement around how they're going to get paid back in that process. And so there we go into the category of angel investors. Angel investors, and I get a lot of questions about this, are mostly good people who want to give back. They also could qualify as friends, families. Any guesses what that last F is? Fools, right? So people who are taking a good guess, they, they want to reinvest in the community. And uh, me and Jeff are joking. That's a common phrase, it's somewhat derogatory. But most of the time, angel investors are people who have been successful entrepreneurship in their own right. They want to invest in some sort of idea to begin with. And so they're looking back into their community that, that, that how they can be able to do that. 
There are angel investor groups, meaning several people who want to pool their funds. How you get access to them is by going in, filling out an application, and giving a pitch to that group, and then working out individual agreements, depending on the group, on how much money they will give you in exchange for what ownership looks like. Any questions on angel investors? Uh, usually, angel investors are slightly smaller deals, lower amounts of money. They also take a less active role in comparison to traditional VCs, meaning they're going to give you money. There's some expectation at some point in time that they're going to get something back, uh, very clear on it. But in general, in comparison to a VC fund, tend to be a little bit lower of a bar of control. Here in Arizona, we have a very interesting market. So I actually added this slide specifically for our market. So when it comes to finding funds, especially in the seed fund, one of the criticisms of our entrepreneurial ecosystem is that startup seed fund is incredibly challenging to come by. There are several groups that have made an effort to try and uh, fix that specific challenge. As a result, there are a couple of programs that are emerging that do seed funding startup uh, and currently, several of them in Phoenix are actually structured as competitions. So if you're not familiar with Venture Fund, anybody familiar with Venture Fund? Venture Madness? So operated through the ACA, uh, applications are currently open if you are interested in it. What that competition looks like is if you are an entrepreneur, you have some sort of, usually they focus on technology or ideas or inventions. You go through, fill out an application, they have a pitch competition, and at the end of the day, they will actually have like literally a March Madness style pitch competition with various entrepreneurs pitching and, and progressing through the pipeline, and they've got judges, and then they actually award a grant at the end of it for the winner of Venture Madness. It, TV. it is. It's Shark Tank, and it, it's now on PBS, so it's not even without TV. I think it's like now on on local networks. There's also several local angel investors that attend that event. So it is an exposure opportunity for lots of entrepreneurs as well. Question. Is that um, Finance Southwest? Is that what that is? So South, it, what is the name of the Southwest group? It's not Finance. What? Invest Southwest in partnership with the Arizona Commerce Authority or the ACA. That's coming up. Yes. So the, uh, usually it's in March. That's why they run the March Madness pieces. But the applications, I believe, are due in January. So that's kind of the, the large competition. We're also seeing a couple of smaller pitch competitions. Innovate Her is a pitch competition specifically targeted for female entrepreneurs operated through the SBA. Again, pitch competition, grant funding at the end of it. How many businesses are taking or doing this kind of thing? Great is question. Is this a little teeny tiny group of people, or is this like thousands of businesses A very, very small percentage. And that's if you include all in vain angel investors, right? When you're talking about like these competitions uh, pieces to them, there's not a lot. You're literally talking 16 finalists that happen at Venture Madness, right, out of all entrepreneurs here in Arizona. And in South by, you know, the Invest Southwest, it's even larger than that. Uh, so it is a very small portion of businesses, mainly in the high tech sphere, mainly in something that is, has IP attached to it that has a, heart, uh, a large scale. However, the reason I bring these up is because there are some opportunities that are there. One, uh, Chandler is very technology focused, so it's good to know that these things are here. And I will also say, in general, we still don't have nearly as competitive of a market. So you can do pretty well in these competitions in comparison to other marketplaces. So Chicago, these competitions, you're getting literally thousands of applicants. You're sitting, you're sitting in Silicon Valley, good luck. You have good, good luck, luck, right? But Phoenix, this is an emerging field. Incubators, which is the other piece that I'll put in there. Uh, lots of people will talk about incubators. One of the things that is different about Phoenix in comparison to other marketplaces, in most other market, not in most, in some other marketplaces, incubators and accelerators actually give funding. So they will provide some sort of seed funding for a startup. Uh, there is only one accelerator that I know of here in the Phoenix market that actually provides some sort of seed funding to be part of them. Most of them help you to connect with inve angel investors and outside funding sources. So it is something that we see in other marketplaces. Usually the agreement is, hey, you go through our 12-week program. We help work with you. You get some sort of space involved with it. You get a mailbox. We give you X amount. 
and then the expectation is that you'll move on after a certain amount of time. We don't really have a lot of this model yet, uh, but hopefully something that we'll see more of. Any questions on incubators or competitions? Phoenix just did that uh, a couple of months ago, uh, with a small business called Rise of the Occasion. Rise of the Rest. Rise, yeah. Yes. And, uh, the, the same type of thing um, you applied for, and it was mainly high tech stuff. Like Crowd Mics was one of them. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're seeing in the banking industry more and more of these tech startups mm -hmm. in that kind of direction, looking for grants, looking for stuff like that. It is. $100, well, it wasn't a grant. It was a prize, and it was get put up by uh, AOL's founder, Steve Case. So it was a competition, very similar. Uh, and this is something to be proud of. So Rise of the Rest is an example of a competition that came to the local market because they heard of all the exciting tech startup things that are happening. Phoenix had the most applicants out of any city that Rise of the Rest has been to in the last several years of that competition. Uh, they also sold out the pitch competition night. So the pitch competition night, they had five finalists. Uh, I'm also proud to say that uh, it wasn't just high tech. There was a couple of high tech ideas. Bio was in there. There was a couple of social entrepreneurship ventures, some real innovative disruptors in their field. Uh, and there was over 1,000 people packed into the deuce in downtown Phoenix. And it was the most people they've ever had show up to a Rise of the Rest event. So they are. They're exciting. It shows that there's lots of momentum in the community, that there's pieces that are going on. But as you said earlier, it is a very small portion of the reality of what small businesses really need to do, need to, to function. So as I mentioned, less than 0.1% really go into. So the number of people, and again, I blame Shark Tank for this, right, and competitions and pitch pieces. We get a lot of people coming in our door like, I want to find an angel investor. Well, they're called angels for a reason, people. They're not real easy to find, right? Like most of them are going to come from your network. There are a couple of angel investor groups, but you do need to be uh, a certain amount of established within your business. You do need to look in the specific fields that those angel investors are interested in. And you need to really have your things together to be interested in those. Interesting. Go ahead. Three of our clients were on Shark Tank. Yeah, we've actually had three clients on Shark Tank. None of them have been funded. On Shark Tank, <laughs> yeah. They were, it, it gave the illusion that they were funded. Mm. But once the deal negotiation started after the cameras were off, the sharks are ruthless. Yeah. And it's very, it's very costly, at least our clients' experience was. It was too costly for them to give up for that, uh, for that feedback, you know, that, that involvement. Which is definitely what crosses into the next category, which is venture capitalists. Uh, Venture capitalists or VCs tend to be a little bit more aggressive than angels. They work with more established firms. They also tend to have uh, much higher. So if you actually look at the percentage, it looks like VCs are a larger percent. It's actually because they do very large deals, right? So these are the ones who back Airbnb and Spanx and things like that, the large 10x uh, investments that are out there. But they do exist. It's important to know. It's another option that are out there, especially once you've gotten some established and you need some funds for rapid growth. Venture capitalist is probably where you're going to end up in that process. Any type of funding that we thought was missing from that list? That you guys came in wondering if they existed? Government. government. What do you mean by government? Uh, like as, as in you all, as in S S or SDA type thing. Yes. So uh, another question we get a lot of question a lot of people asking us about is. Where are the grants? I need a grant to start my business. Uh, I get this probably the number one question because I mainly work with women entrepreneurs. And I work a lot in women entrepreneurial advocacy. So I get a lot of people in my office, I want a women business owner grant. Well, that's great. You know why? Because it doesn't really exist. <laughs> Right? There's a couple of small grants that are out there. Most of them are from nonprofit pieces. The Innovate Her is technically considered a grant, right? Meaning they are money that is given without any strings attached. Uh, but veteran owned businesses and women owned businesses, we get a lot of questions about grants to start businesses. For the most part, they don't really exist. There's a couple of smaller organizations, some competition pieces. But really, the reality is grants are one of those things that I feel like people talk about all the time doesn't really exist. Plus, I got to put a picture of a unicorn in my presentation. So I was super psyched about that opportunity. Are you talking about grants for startups or are you talking about grants for 
because I know like uh, genetics made simple in Tucson. Mm -hmm. They've been existing in business for 10 years, and they get, and they receive, I think, over $14 million. So what they receive is SBIR grants, or they get grants to do specific innovation research pieces. So there are SBIR grants where they are paid, they get grant funding to do specific expansion or research into high technology fields, uh, which is a little bit of a caveat to it, for sure. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, but in general, when it comes to startup grants to start your business, they don't necessarily exist. There are some opportunities and grants around scaling, research, innovation, SBIR, is the is the existing program that is mainly government funded depending on the agency you have to work with them uh, to do that and we actually work with several clients to put together SBIR grants well, what was that deal with solar where supposedly the government granted hundred million dollars and I went to what was that, that, one? that one I don't know too much about The grant program that they did, they were investing in research in it and nothing came of it or something to that effect. I never trust anything a politician says in a, in a debate, so I don't know. I didn't Google that. Fact check it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a good question. Okay. All right. So it does exist. The concept on the SBIRs and the STTRs, or technology uh, transfers and that, the government has, has come up with an, an issue or problem. And that's really, they put it out, and they, there's an annual process that they basically broadcast, here's the problem. And then people pick and choose what, what they think they, you know, have an expertise at going out and, and resolving. And in the first phase, it's usually around 250000 is the award. And it's usually awarded to three, um, three companies. And then they narrow it down to a phase two award to two, and then a phase three award is where the big bucks are because your phase three award is, phase two is kind of proof of concept. Phase three is, okay, commercialization. The neat thing about that that the government has set up is, is that at the commercialization phase, you are in no bid to the entire United States government. So any agency is free reign to you to go market whatever that solution product that you built. I was going to say, but it sounds like that's almost for existing companies. That's not really it is. money to a new It startup. is absolutely for existing companies that already have some sort of validation. And the SBIR process is not an easy one. And, and you have to work fairly close with those organizations. All right. Debt. Loans. Right? We have a couple of bankers in the room. No offense. These are goblins. But I feel like this is a description. Yeah. <laughs> See? <laughs> there you go. Right? You're the tall one. There you go. I'm the tall guy. And, the, and we work with bankers, and, I, and they're a tremendous asset to it. But I think that, and I think bankers and loan and debt equity in general gets a bad rap uh, when it comes to small businesses, right? So I've had several small businesses tell me, you know, bankers bring an umbrella when the sun is shining, right? Yeah. So that kind of, yeah, you've said that? There you go. <laughs> See? Yep. Oh, yep. Especially restaurants. Yeah, yeah restaurants, yeah. right? Yeah. Price is a for small business help small business. So in 2008, when Lehman Brothers crossed the market crash, I went to the bank and they just left it. Yeah, 2008, you're a restaurant going to a bank. That that's a rough I'm pull. It's always <laughs> raining, right? <laughs> And so that's what this is. This is kind of why I wanted to start off on a lighter foot because I think that that, that like I said, most bankers, like the gentleman in the room, are here to help small businesses. Making sure that you understand the banker's relationship. It is a business. How can you invest? How can you work with them? I think is really kind of a critical question. It's important to know that there's different types of banks, right? So not all banks are fits for all businesses. It's important to know, is it a national bank, a regional bank, a community bank? What are their expertise, right? Being able to fit with those processes. So bankers aren't allowed to answer, but uh, someone give me an answer on what is an SBA guaranteed loan? All right, bankers, you can answer now. George, give me a definition of an SBA guaranteed loan. Don't get too fancy. <laughs> SBA guaranteed loan, George. Banks don't like risk, so we'll reach out to the SBA as a partner, and then if the SBA would do the deal, then you would be a guarantor. Mm -hmm. It's 10, 7, 7 percent or whatever, which reduces the risk and makes banks feel more comfortable because they have a partner that's established that would pay the debt back or your percentage of the debt back if that business were to fail. There you go. 
Thank you very much. So just to be clear, let's say the person is borrowing 100000 and it's a 50-50 risk sharing, or let's say the person loses 50000 does SBA pay the full 50000 or 25% or 25000 which is 50% of the total loan amount? 50% of the total loan amount. So the bank uh, has got skin in the game. Yep. Oh, yeah. The, the game. Yeah, the bank's got skin in the game. So we don't have as much skin in the game, so we're a little more comfortable. A little bit more comfortable. It is a more arduous process because you've got the federal government backing your loan. So they, you literally have to go through approval process with the SBA as well as the bank in that process. Uh, where we see lots of loans and especially the SBA guaranteed loans is you're an established business that's looking to scale, right? You need to grow, you need to buy a building, you need to expand into equipment. That's really where a banker becomes your best friend. Uh, most bankers that I talk to, and there's a couple of alternative lending. I definitely Googled alternative lending to put an image on this slide. It wasn't great. Uh, alternative lending options that come that, you know, micro lending, crowdfunding is now a piece. There's factoring, there's asset base. So there's lots and lots of different options that are out there. Uh, the important piece to know is, again, lots of different options that are out there. What is it that you are looking for? How much money do you really need? Uh, it never ceases to, affect, to, this is always the way that it works, I think I need 50 grand, right? Those numbers are things that we need to find, right? And you've already, there's already some people in the room that can help you with that process. Literally, how much money do you need to grow? Because what we don't want to do is way undershoot it, right? And then we've loaned you enough money and it doesn't actually get to the point where they can pay you back. And we don't want to way overshoot it where now you've got a ton of money and you're not able to utilize it effectively. So the first question I ask is, how much money do you need? What are you going to be doing with it? And then how are you going to pay it back? A bank is a business, right? They want to know that you're going to be able to pay them back. So you put together those key questions, things that are important to think about when you're going in and talking to a bank is they are going to think about the credit. Does it make sense for them as a deal, right? They are going to look at your personal credit line to make sure you've got decent credit going into it. They're going to look at collateral. So literally, how much, how much can they take back if things go wrong, right? The risk that is associated with it. They're going to look at your character, your credit history. So they're looking at all of these five Cs to determine, does it make sense? Will we get our money back if we loan those funds? The loan application process. So I'm actually going to share with you the tool. And uh, this is always the piece that Jeff likes to hand out to all of our lender partners as well. So what does a process of going to a bank look like? Putting together a business plan, you want to have your business plan, your financials ready, so that when you go in and you talk to a banker, you're giving them a clear understanding of what you're using the money for, what does it look like, uh, how much money do you really need, right? And there's definitely a certain amount of trust that goes into that. So making sure that you have that relationship built and hopefully beforehand, right? How do we help? I took this picture of Jeff this morning in the desk. So this is kind of the part where the SBDC comes in, right? We kind of serve as a nice intermediate step of, hey, I need funding, right? And instead of just walking in your local bank branch and knocking on the door and saying, hey, give me money, right? We actually work with small business owners to put together those financial projections, to put together the business plan. Uh, we actually ask those kind of key questions, and then we help you because we've got relationships built with, almost, with several lenders across the valley. We know what, they're, uh, what it is that they loan on, what it is the areas that they are experts in, uh, and we've built those relationships. So we can help direct you on all of those different options that are up there. We can actually say, hey, have you considered this? We might want to go talk to this, you know, this lender. We might want to actually consider this piece to it. So we serve as that, that go-between as you're starting to determine what pieces make the most sense for you as you're starting to fund your business. Anything else you wanted to add to that, Jeff? It's your photo that's up there. <laughs> Isn't it lovely? <laughs> no, I think the, the key that... Um, our clients are the small business owners, but our clients also are the banks. I mean, we get funded by the SBA, so we serve as both the lenders and the small business owners. Yes? Uh, my question is, so like you say small business, can you define that, the size of that market? Mm -hmm. How do you define it by number of employees, number of sales? We, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, because we're an SBA program, we follow the SBA guidelines. 
and they base it off of industry. So some industries are based off of headcount. On average, you know, there's a, a long list of, of industries that we have that it's, it's usually around 250 or more employees a year out of the SBA um, program, you know, qualified. And usually around 30 to 50 million um, is the revenue side. Um, is, but it's, it's really... So I, I with those numbers, we work with the vast numbers. majority of small businesses. Um, you know, a dealership, I have a dealership, and their number is 750 employees. Mm -hmm. It is, because of the industry. What the SBA has set up as far as their guidelines on if you can qualify to, part to participate in an SBA lending program, then you can, guarantee, you can really participate in the SBDC program. So the, the, short, yeah, the short answer to your question is we work with pretty much everybody, unless you're Intel. Right? Unless, you're, unless you're a large corporation, we're going to work with you to try and help get whatever resources you need and help you in that process. So that's kind of how we fit into the process. Uh, when it comes to getting money from the bank and lending, there's a couple of key things that we wanted to add into. Right? So lots of people, and this is the reality of the nature, you have to go to a couple of different banks, right? You're going to have to do some shopping around. Be prepared for that. It is best, and I am constantly advised on this, one, get a good referral, right? Don't just walk into a branch and knock on a door and Susie was in college yesterday and is now a banker in the front is going to, you know, be kind of the go-between. Who is it that is part of the chamber? You know, the gentlemen that are around you, sit down and talk to them. Uh, Every lender I've talked to wants to build relationships with business owners, right? They should be part of your team from the get-go uh, as a business owner. So build that relationship before you get in there. Share with them what's going on. Have those pieces in place. If you do get turned down, uh, don't take it personally, which is easy to do, right? But ask why. What is it that, that is happening? Start digging through those questions. Legally, all banks are required to take your application, right? And look at it. Uh, but there's lots of reasons, and it might not be your specific business. It's possible that they have, lend, they have given as much as they can in your industry for this year that they're allowed to give. I don't, I don't care who you are. We cannot look, lend you money or even bank you if you sell pot for a living. Yep. Medical marijuana. Right, and are there some there are some lenders out there that will do that, or you know, up in, Colorado. up in Colorado, and so we might have to go out of state. So there are lots of options that are out there, and negotiating all of them is important. But don't think that one no is I'm not fundable across the board, right? So ask questions, keep persistent, know going into it that you should build relationships, and you're going to have to go to a couple of them. What if the answer is yes, right? Uh, some people get so excited at yes, they just run out the door, right? And it's like, oh, thank God, they gave me money, <laughs> right? Make sure that you know that no matter where the money is coming from, uh, what is the expectations with there? Are there negotiation options that you can come back to them? So keep those conversations open. And let's talk about the elephant in the room. When it comes to money, right, when you are in your business, at some point in time, people are expecting a return, right? You are basically buying into a marriage. It is easy to think that, oh, I'm just giving money. They're going to let me do my own thing. One day they're going to come back knocking when I'm really famous, and they're going to want some of that money back. Whether it's friends, whether it's George, whether it's Jeff cutting a personal check as an angel investor, whatever it looks like. Know what you're getting into. Work with a lawyer to make sure that those agreements are straightforward, that you have clear understandings of what the expectations are. If you're getting it from friends and family, if you're getting it from the bank, what are the requirements that they're going to ask for you from? So understand that no money is free. And I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs that get really anxious when they talk about debt equity or angel investors. Well, what happens if I'm not successful, right? Well, I don't want to put my house up as collateral. At some point in time, you're a risk. Small businesses fail a lot, right? And if you're not willing to take the risk to put your own name and your own credit on the line, how is our expectation that other people should do that for us, right? Most businesses start relatively underfunded in comparison to what they really should. 
So the question comes down to what do the numbers show? How much money do you really need? And the reality is every business at some point in time needs funding to grow. It is the lifeblood of businesses. Making sure that you've got solid financials, that you're running your business, that you understand what it looks like moving forward. And most importantly, because I think a lot of business owners get overwhelmed, right? How can I grow my business if it means that I'm not going to be able to give my kids a college education or supply my parents with the caring that they're going to need in their old age, right? How do I put that business out there? So work through those opportunities. Make sure your numbers make sense and build a team around you. You don't need to know all of the ins and outs of your money, but you better be able to answer the right questions to make sure you're working with the right people, right? To be able to answer those questions effectively. So get all of those elements in line. Build your team of people that will be able to answer those questions and know that sometimes you're going to have to shop, you're going to have to build relationships, and it's not going to always look pretty to make it happen. But there are lots of opportunities that are out there. And most importantly, your community and your SBDC clients are here for you. So if you need any help, let us know. And hopefully it's just the start of the conversation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and people watching online, because I know that we're recording those pieces. Uh, any questions? Let's open it up and talk a little bit. Any questions, thoughts, funding options? I have a totally different one. How about it? I love it? what you did here. I love some of the statistics and, Thank and you. The, the way you captured some of the not so common common sense. Yeah. Um, even though I'm not allowed to talk to clients for my, because of my personality, um, can I just talk about <laughs> this uh, yes. uh, presentation? Yep, absolutely. Take my business card and I'll email it to you. Okay. Send that back there. There you go. What, what was on my picture? Yeah. <laughs> I'll delete it. That's the one we were going to post on Facebook. Right? <laughs> this is the man. This is the man. Hey, Help if, if it money. gets us clients, we're okay with that. Free money, right? Yeah. He's in charge of all the grants. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question is, um, what, one of the things that we're working with a lot of clients is, is that they, they've, they've gotten their business from A to B, <clears throat> now they're going to the next level. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that they're, when you're doing the financials, where what we found and where we actually see an opportunity is, uh, we think we see an opportunity, we're awfully new, but getting the financials ready so that it makes sense for them to be funded further. Yeah. Absolutely. And so we, he, he does that. I, I, he's not allowed to talk to clients, and I'm not allowed to model anything. Yeah. So that's how it works. Um, and so what we do is we're able to model uh, things. We did, a, we, we did a deal with a, a, a trucking company where the guy was borrowing 100000 at 9%, and mm -hmm. we were able just to save him money just by getting to cut that down to 70000 because he would put half down and then do dealer uh, GMAC finance. Yeah. And it went from nine to three percent on yeah. his loan. So just things like that to, to make the business rationalize the business expenses and so forth. Uh, questions to those of you who have experience. Is that a common issue? Am I that am I seeing more than 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 I think? I would I would say it is common for entrepreneurs to uh, struggle with projections. Uh, in particular, I think the struggle with projections is I, I get this I'm making up numbers. Yeah. You are, right? But it's an educated guess, right? And the, the more you can get educated, and especially if you're an established business, and like you said, modeling off of, hey, this is what has happened, uh, the clearer those pictures, the more that you could figure out what your options are that's in there. So unfortunately, and we have one of our cornerstone pro, uh, programs is called Profit Mastery, uh, and it comes down to financial literacy. As an entrepreneur, understanding what do your financial statements say, what, how much money do you really need. Uh, and the reality is most entrepreneurs don't have the time to put together you know, really comprehensive financial statements and things like that, which is why you need a team of multiple experts to be able to see and understand that. And like I said, there is no black and white when it comes to funding. Right? Everything's kind of in the gray. It's what makes sense? What can we afford? How can we cut it? And absolutely, there are some finite best ways to make sure you get funding so that you're not... Uh, funding your way right into a hole. Same thing with sales. We have clients, the number of clients that come in and say, I just need more sales. Do you? One financial projection later shows that, yeah, we can increase your sale and all of a sudden you have sold your way into bankruptcy because you're not actually looking at your financial numbers close enough to be able to, to make sure it makes sense. What trends do you see? Um, you mentioned that friends and family and your own personal savings is how startups are. Mm -hmm. call it. Um, but a year or two in, um, where does that change? Where does, where does crowdfunding and such begin to become a bigger issue? That's first question. Mm -hmm. Second question is with the um, 
change in administration, where do you see the next year going on any kind of government programs or financing? Will capital free up? What's, what's the future look like? Oh, man. I'd be a much more higher paid individual if I had an answer to those questions, I think. Jeff? I can share something that the SBA set a, set a record um, for their fiscal year. We're um, recording this, so they want you to be, have the yeah, audio for people online. Sorry, yeah. the SBA set a record. They, they, they lent out, basically, they're under their guarantee program, the most that they've ever lent out this year. Um, so they had to go back to Congress three or four months early. Early to ask for more money. Because they're out of, they're out of their guarantee program uh, funds. So I would say that the expectation is that it won't go backwards. It will go forwards. Um, you know, that's, that's our hope. Um, what we're seeing is, um, there is there is a turn. That, you know, it has, you know, when we supposedly got out of the, the doldrums, whatever we want to call the great, you know, recession, whatever. The dark times. Uh, the dark times, right? <laughs> um, we saw, I think Arizona and Phoenix was very slow to rebound. And we're starting to see a lot more business starts, a lot more growth opportunities. So, I mean, we're very encouraged. Um, you know, we've, we're at 12 full-time counselors. Uh, we probably need 20. Because the you number know, of businesses that yeah, are starting and growing, especially in is Phoenix. A, is 100 plus clients. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So. And then back to your, back to my first question on where do you see the funding? Where, where are they going for financing at that point? Yeah. So in general, it just depends. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that they get financing. The crowdfunding piece really doesn't come in until they're somewhat established. Most of like the industry pieces, they're established and they're looking to scale, which depending on the organization is six months to two years in. Uh, that you'll usually see some crowdfunding elements come into place. Uh, but for the most part, it's still Bootstrapping, a lot of them are how do I get up and over, and then frankly, lines of credit to get uh, the, the majority of the growth that's in there until they really get to the, to the established phase and are looking to scale past uh, what one or two locations might look like. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. the, um, I think what, we've, what we see is, is the crowdfunding buzz. Um, now that the equity side is, is there, um, we're seeing more of it, let's say more of an interest. Mm -hmm. um, they're still trying to figure out for Arizona because if you're in Arizona, you have to qualify, you know, based on Arizona law, national law, you know, so, I mean, there's still a lot. So, you know, we see a, a lot of clients asking about crowdfunding. We don't see a lot of clients doing crowdfunding. Yeah. From an equity standpoint, I don't think we have, we have any, any clients. But I have, I have two clients that have run successful crowdfunding yeah. campaigns in the last six months uh, to fund various ventures. So I think that it is a growing area, but both of them were established in the community and looking to scale elements yeah, to it. Is equity crowdfunding like millions? People aren't looking for 100,000 No, it's still, it's for... smaller than that. It's definitely going to be smaller than that, uh, than the millions in the traditional angel funding category piece to it. Uh, so it's kind of supposed to be somewhere in the middle. And uh, every piece of research is showing that crowdfunding will be a, a bit of a game changer. So we've actually seen less VC do dollars go in. There was less VC deals last year than any year since 2000. Uh, so less VC deals, actually less angel funds, uh, less angel deals going into it. Crowdfunding is becoming kind of the more uh, popular option of those. That was according to Entrepreneur Magazine that I read last night. So. <laughs> I was going to share that. Mm -hmm. I've started a bunch of companies, and today if I were to start a company, um, I wouldn't do an angel. I'd, I'd go the crowd because of the control. Yeah. You know, you bring in angels, you know, you've got investors that will have a direct hand. You bring in the crowdfunding, you have shareholders. They still have shareholder rights and participation on that side. But on the equity the side. But, but once again, crowdfunding tends to be companies that are already established and such. Crowdfunding is not getting used for, I want to start my own um, build a pen. Professional company. services company. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Professional it's, services are still uh, the very small minority of, of funds that you're seeing well, on there. And also, too, 
from what you're saying, crowdfunding is is not startups, which I think a lot of people think that crowdfunding is like all startups. Yeah. Well, and it's not. It is startups, right? Yeah. But it's people who have established networks. So my one client that did really that completed a successful crowdfunding campaign was a startup by traditional standards. She already had the IP, she had the manufacturing lined up, but she hadn't sold a single item. But she was very well established in the community. So she had been an entrepreneur before, she had lots of friends that were on social media, and she leveraged that existing presence into crowdfunding success. Right. So the first rule of crowdfunding is have 5,000 Facebook friends. It's actually, there's lots of them, yes. It's mainly <laughs> have, it's have not only crowd, I would say not only Facebook friends, but frankly it's have a couple people already, to, already willing to invest in you and you're just greasing the wheel. As bankers, we don't care how many Facebook friends you have, folks. That's not true. <laughs> I have lots of them, <laughs> right? Something that I'd like to add that uh, Kristen and I have gone to a couple of national conferences in the last probably, what, four months, four or five months, and crowdfunding has been one of the key topics. Um, the key takeaway that I've picked up on is if you're going to do it, the history has now shown that if you don't have 40% um, already in the bank, pre-sold kind of, that you've already got 40% people that are going to commit and, and uh, participate, um, the likelihood of your success is remote. Yeah, so the client I was talking about that was successful, she, the example she gave, she goes, yeah, I had to teach my grandfather how to use Kickstarter because he was giving me like two grand and so I had to set him up on Kickstarter, right, in order for him to, to loan. She goes, so they don't tell you about that part, right? <laughs> so that's what, you've already got pieces of it, you've got established network and that kind of helps to leverage it. Any other questions? I know we're wrapping up on time. Helpful, you guys? Yeah. Learn something? Good. George, anything I said incorrect? He needs the microphone. He wants to make sure this is captured for posterity. I, I think it's been great. I think from a banker standpoint, for not just particularly startups, but for anybody who wants to come in and borrow money, the more prepared you are, which you said is excellent. Get the legal people, get the financial people. Uh, I have so many, so many people come in and want to borrow money, and I ask them for financial statements, and it's like deer in the headlights. They have no clue what I'm even talking about, which is sad. Because if your income statements don't equal your balance sheets, then, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. And it's not unusual for a small business to do that. They're running their business, and they want to save money, so they're going to do their own accounting. But get legal legal advice, get accounting advice. And an SBDC counselor. And, S and absolutely. <laughs> and that's what, that's what we always tell our clients, and that's what, if your balance sheet doesn't match up, that's the stuff we look for. So we'll actually review it, and you much rather have the, an SBDC counselor catch it than have the banker catch it. Uh, one of the clips that I would love to one day put in a presentation on funding, sorry guys, Magic Mike has a scene where he goes to get an SBA loan and he literally brings pictures of the furniture that he makes and is like, but see, I make furniture. And they're like, we don't care. And I was like, oh, way to go Magic Mike on how to educate about an SBA loan. Thank you. It is educational and entertaining all at the same time. I'll uh, share an entertaining one. I had a client who actually wanted to show a million dollars the first year in his net income. He insisted on it. And uh, he, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, when I pointed out that uh, he was having gross margins of 95%, he was asking if that was good or not. <laughs> so, yep. And that's what, we, that's what the Profit Mastery class that we do, we go through and we actually can pull industry averages. Like literally, how much money are you making? Uh, one of the things that I get when I work with a lot of women is, I feel like I can't go to the bank because I'm not successful. What does successful mean, right? And you ask them, well, what is successful? Well, you know, I, I only pay myself like 70 grand a year. Are you making money? That is successful, right? But somewhere in our head, we think that banks, because there's, they need to talk to people who are in profit and things like that, they think it needs to be millions of dollars. No, there are lots of bankers that you put together the right package, you're, you're putting together a business, they're loaning their life things. We can figure th things out that are in that process. So I would say don't be scared of uh, bankers and, and all the options that are out there because there are lots of things. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much. Thank you, Chandler Chamber, for having us out there. Everybody get a copy of the uh, investor sheet. And we do actually have the, the hot off the presses SBA list of top SBA lenders, if you're curious about that information. Don't worry, George, you're covered.
I think you're good. I think the phone's off. You can go ahead. Yep. I'll turn off the mic.